thank you for clicking over to this video from Exodus Church. I'm David Neen, and I'm one of the pastors here. We pray that as you worship with us, you would be blessed and reminded of the good news that we have in the life and the promises of Jesus Christ. Exodus Church seeks to be a redeemed people who worship and serve God in the world. So celebrate with us now as we gather together and enjoy him, beginning with this reading from the Word of God. Isaiah 55 verses 1 to 3 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy and be satisfied in the Lord today. Heal us, Emmanuel, here we are. We long to feel thy touch Deep wounded souls to thee we fly Oh Savior, hear our cry Our faith is feeble, we confess Faintly trust thy word But will you pity us the less Be that far from you, Lord See, heal us, heal us Emmanuel, here we are Long to feel thy touch, deep wounded souls to thee we fly. Oh, Savior, hear our cry. Remember him who once complied with trembling for. Lord, I believe with tears he cried. Oh, help my unbelief. Oh, heal us, Emmanuel, here we are. We long to feel thy touch. more time, heal us, heal us, Emmanuel, here we are, we long to feel thy touch, deep wounded souls to thee we fly, oh Savior, hear I cry.
Hey guys, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so grateful that you would join in on this video. And I hope this music and teaching is an encouragement to you. Now, if you're our guest, if you're not part of our Exodus family, we would love to follow up with you. So if you'll send an email to the address at the bottom of your screen. Now, this past Thursday, we had a community group leader training. Uh, These are men and women who carry a significant amount of weight in how they care disciple and shepherd the people of our church and we are so grateful for them now if you are in a group I want to ask you this week to express your gratitude to your group leader send them a text give them a gift card bake them some cookies just do something to say thank you to them because their their ministry to you has not diminished during this very difficult season so I want to just encourage you to thank them. Now, if you'll take your Bible and turn to James 1, uh, we're in a series in the book of James that's calling us to a true and living faith. Now, one of the difficulties about this call to a true and living faith is that it brings us face to face with our limits. So if we're going to trust Jesus as Savior, we have to admit we cannot trust ourselves and we cannot save ourselves. And if we're going to trust him as Lord of our lives, then we have to admit that we're not Lord ourselves. So this call to true and living faith brings us face to face with our limits. And for many of us, this is very frustrating. We don't like to think of ourselves as having limits. And we can see that in how we spend our time. We can see that in how we spend our money. We can see that in the things we commit to at work and in our community. We like to live as if we are limitless and we are not. I've been meeting with a a counselor for about eight years and he has said to me over and over, Brian, you need to learn to love your limits. And we need to learn to love our limits because they remind us of who we are, that we are finite beings who have limits. And they remind us of who God is, that he is an infinite God with no limits at all. And I love this one. I love that God is infinite with no limits at all. And I hate this one. I hate the idea that I have limits. But if I'm going to live into this call to a true and living faith, I have to understand, not not just understand that I have limits, I have to learn to love. I have to learn to love my limits. And so James today is going to call us, uh, he's going to bring us face to face with limits in two areas. And my hope is that our limits will drive us back to the one who has none. Okay, so we're going to read James 1 verses 5 through 11, then I'll pray, and we'll jump into God's word. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind, for that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we come to you now acknowledging uh, our, our limits. We acknowledge that we are not God, that you are. We acknowledge we cannot save ourselves, but you have saved us in Jesus. We acknowledge that we need you. We, we, we're listening to your word because we need to hear from you, Lord. So Lord, would you speak? Would you speak in ways that, that, we, that our hearts crave today? Lord, you know every, every heart listening to this, you know every story So Holy Spirit, uh, you are infinite in your wisdom, so would you speak into every heart listening here? And Lord, I acknowledge my limits, like speaking in this way, in this medium, Lord, I'm limited. So Lord, I need your power, I need your grace, I need your mercy for this moment. Lord, thank you that you give generously when we ask. So Lord, we're asking, we want to meet with you, we want to experience your goodness and grace in this moment. And so, Lord, we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to see two limits today. We're going to see the limit of our wisdom and the limit of our resources, and we need to learn to love both of them. Let's start with the limit of our wisdom. Look at verse 5. James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, 
who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, James mentions here the limit to our wisdom. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. But before we talk about the limit of our wisdom, we need to ask, what is wisdom? What is James saying about wisdom here? Now, uh, the Bible talks about wisdom in a few different ways. Uh, for in one, one way, we could speak of wisdom as learning from others. A friend of mine says wisdom is just a long memory. Like we, we learn from the mistakes of others and our own mistakes. That's certainly one of the things wisdom is. Wisdom is also the accumulation and application of knowledge. I think uh, Solomon is going after both of those in the book of Proverbs. But here in James, James is looking at wisdom from a different direction. And in James 1, wisdom is not the accumulation or application of knowledge. James is a gift from God. It's something we receive from God when we ask. Now in James 3, he mentions wisdom again. And he says this, but the wisdom from above, that's another way of saying it comes from God. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, again, uh, wisdom is from above, so it's a gift from God, but here James is speaking of wisdom um, in, in the way we demonstrate our lives more than what we declare from our mouths. So wisdom here is spoken of being peaceable and gentle and sincere and impartial, and man, do we need that kind of wisdom today. We need this kind of wisdom that's a gift from God that is demonstrated in our lives. And that's what James is talking about. And I feel the lack of it. Don't don't you? Like I feel my lack of wisdom all the time. There's so many things I lack wisdom about. I, I lack wisdom about the future. Cheryl and I were talking about 2021 the other day and just thinking about next year, which seems so far away and so hard to think about right now. But we're going to celebrate 25 years of, of, of marriage next year. We've got a child graduating from high school and going to college. And, and so we're asking for wisdom about how to look at that and how to plan and how to think about that. We need wisdom. We need wisdom about the present, like this, this new stage of parenting for us where we've got a child at college and now our family is changing and different. How do, we, how do we parent? We need wisdom for that. We need wisdom about how to vote in November and, and even how to talk to one another about that decision. We need wisdom. We need wisdom about how to move forward as a church. Uh, our, our culture is kind of turning a curve here. Schools are starting. Uh, sports are starting in some areas. We're, we're kind of starting to re-engage some things. And so as a church, we're asking God for wisdom about what we're about to step into in this next chapter. And so on September 2nd, Exodus Students is starting back. You can pray for Pastor Tyler. On September 14th, Exodus Women, a Bible study is starting. And and they've got lots of different ways for women to engage that. You can pray for Joy and her team as they they lead that effort. You can pray for October 4th. We're planning to start Exodus Kids from four-year-old and under on October 4th. You can pray for Kelsey and her team as they make efforts to do that. And you can pray for wisdom because every step forward we take as a culture and as a church will be a risk of some kind. And so what we're wanting to do as a church and as leaders is we want to risk with wisdom and react with care. And so you can pray for us in this because every step is a reminder that we lack wisdom. So when we feel that, when we feel the limit of our wisdom, what do we do? Well, we can do two things. Uh, First, we can just try to figure it out. We lack wisdom, so I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to trust myself. I'm going to trust my instincts. Now, what's interesting about that is that we've already acknowledged we lack wisdom. And so in our lack of wisdom, we're going to try to gain wisdom. Now, that sounds crazy, and I do it all the time. The other option is we can do what James says in verse 5. We can ask God. We can humble ourselves and say, God, I I need wisdom. I lack wisdom. I need it from you. And notice what James says about God. Look at verse 5. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. Like God's character and God's heart is to put a dump truck of wisdom into our hearts and lives. He wants to give generously. And notice, to all. Like there's, there's not just a few people he gives that way. To all 
without reproach. I love that phrase because we're not gonna come to God and ask for wisdom and, he, and him say to us, you're asking again? Like you're asking for wisdom again, you again? No, he, he loves to give generously and it says it will be given him. So God loves to give wisdom to those who ask. And then James gives us a warning in verse six. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So what is he saying? So, so God's generous to give wisdom, but if we doubt, he won't. Like, what does doubting mean? Now, now, doubting doesn't mean you never have questions. It doesn't mean you don't have uh, uh, concerns about what the Bible teaches, or maybe you're unclear about some things. That's not the kind of doubting that James is talking about here. What James is talking about is this person who doubts, he's double-minded. He's like a wave tossed by the wind. And, and think of it this way. It's a person who, who has one foot on God's wisdom and one foot on his wisdom. That's what he's talking about. He's like, he, he's this person that's asking God while trying to figure it out on their own. And what James is saying is, no, no, no. If you put one foot here and one foot there, you'll fall in the lake. That's what he's saying. Think of a person on a pier trying to get into a canoe and they're, they're stepping in and they have a foot on both places and they fall in. That's what James is talking about here. And what James says is put all your weight on God's generosity and none of your weight on your wisdom. Because if we put any weight on our wisdom, we'll end up leaning that direction. And so James says, if we ask, put all of our weight on God's generosity and none of our weight on our wisdom. James wants us to remember we lack wisdom. We have a limit to our wisdom. And he wants us to remember that God is generous to supply wisdom when we ask. We need to see this limit and we need to learn to love it. The second limit we need to learn to love is the limit of our resources. Look at verse nine. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuit. So James is talking about two groups of people here. He's talking about lowly people or poor people He's talking about rich people. And James wants us to understand there is a limit to our resources. There are some things that money can't buy. And first, James speaks to the lowly in verse 9. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Let, let a poor person boast in the reality that Christ has saved him. That Christ has saved him from his financial state and put him in a state of grace where he has received forgiveness of sin and the righteousness of Christ and the hope we have in God. And this lowly brother is to boast in that reality. He wants him to remember that Christ has saved him. And he wants him to boast in this because there is a unique danger that poor people have. And the unique danger poor people have is that they could start to believe that what they could gain might save them. Poor people might start to believe if I just had more. But, uh, and certainly, more money helps some problems, but more, simply more, is rarely the answer to our financial problems. If you, if you don't believe me, just Google lottery and people who lost it all. People who had more money than they could ever fathom who lost it all. More of what doesn't satisfy our souls will never satisfy us no matter how much we get. That's why James wants lowly people to boast in their exaltation from Christ. The next group James speaks to is those who are rich in verse 10. He says, and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Now there's two problems for us in this passage. First, we always put ourselves in the wrong category. We think that because we know people who have more, that we are poor. And in the global economy, we are all wealthy people. The second problem we have is we tend to think that being rich means you don't have problems. Now, we, we think if, if people have more money than us, they don't have problems. The truth is they just have different problems. 
and we don't see the very real dangers that James highlights here for those who are wealthy. There are dangers to being rich and sometimes our desire for what, for what we think others have blinds us to the very real dangers they face. I mean, think about rich believers with me for a moment. They have, they have a lot of what the world thinks they should have. They have money, they have power, they have security. And, and, and the danger for rich believers is that they can start to think they did that on their own. They can start to think that they uh, don't need God now because they have these things that the world tells them they need. And then they can live into this false narrative as believers that they, that they gained this on their own and they don't need God anymore. Poor people, would, poor people don't, don't think that way. They, they, have another, they, have, they have other struggles that they think about, but this, there's a, or there are unique dangers for those who are trusting Christ who have been blessed with money. And so notice what the rich are to do in verse 9, verse 10. It says, the rich in his humiliation. Now, it's interesting God, that James calls the, both groups to boast in something. The poor are to boast in their exaltation. They are to boast in the reality that Christ has done something for them. The rich are to boast a different direction. They're to boast in their humiliation. The poor are to boast in what Christ has done for them. The rich are to boast in the reality that they could not do it for themselves. And so James calls the poor to boast in what Christ has done and the rich to boast in the reality that they could not do it. They're to boast in this. And then James warns the rich to go on living in the reality that their money cannot save or sustain. Look at verse 11. It says, For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in his pursuits. We don't believe the last part of verse 11. We don't believe the last part of verse 11. We, we don't believe that there is a great danger in a desire to be rich. We, we don't believe that. Now listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to work hard or seek a promotion or ask for a raise or try to provide for your family. I'm not saying any of that is wrong. What I'm saying is a desire to be rich, thinking that more money will satisfy our souls, leads us to a dangerous place. It says in verse 11 that the, the rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. James wants poor people to rejoice in the reality that Christ has saved them. He wants rich people to rejoice in the reality that they could not save themselves. He wants both of them to love the limits of their resources. Now, one of the ways we want to help you grow in loving the limits of your resources is to offer a class called Financial Peace University. This is a nine-week course starting in September to help you grow in how to steward what God has given, if you want more information, uh, you can email the address at the bottom of your screen, info at the exoduschurch.org. So James wants us to learn to love our limits. He wants to love the limit of our wisdom. He wants us to love the limit of our resources. And so the question we have to answer right now is will you love your limits? Will you love, your, I, listen, I gotta confess to you, I don't. Like, I, I don't love my limits. I don't love not knowing. I don't love not having clarity. I don't love not having enough sometimes, whatever I think enough means. I struggle with not loving my limits. But God loves our limits because in our limits, he gets to show that he is limitless. God loves our limits because in our limits, he gets to show that he's limitless. Listen, listen to what God's word says in Psalm 103. It says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Get this, God knows our limits. God is not surprised that I need wisdom. He is not surprised that my money can't save me. He knows my limits and he has compassion on me. God knows my limits. And then 1 Corinthians 1 tells us that he chooses us because of our limits. Look at, look at what God's word says. It says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. 
God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God chose those with limits to shame those who think they have no limits. God, listen, God loves our limits. He is not put off by them. He doesn't run out of patience with them. He loves our limits because our limits show that he is limitless. And so when we lack wisdom, God gets to show off his wisdom and generosity. And when, we, when, we, when our resources are insufficient to save, God gets to show that his resources are mighty to save. And when our limits cause us to sin and fall short of the glory of God, he gets to show off his son who died on the cross to forgive us for our sin and to free us from all sin and unrighteousness. God loves our limits, do we? Will we learn to love our limits? Will we learn to love the fact that we need God? James is calling us to a true and living faith. And that kind of faith requires us at every step to admit that we need the Lord. I want us to love our limits today. James wants us to love the limit of our wisdom. He wants us to love the limit of our resources. He wants us to love the reality that we have limits and that God is limitless. Will you love your limits today? Will you love the reality that you need God today? And will you fall on your face and say to him, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. I have no hope in the world without you, God. That's what it means to respond to God with a true and living faith today. To say to him, I need you. I can't do this without you. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we confess to you that we need you. We lack wisdom. We lack the ability to save ourselves. Our, res- our money can't save. Our money can't sustain. Like we, we, we have so many limits. Lord, thank you that you know every one of them. That you love us in them that in those limits, you get to show off your limitlessness. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you are limitless. Lord, remind me, remind me of that when I face the reality of my limits. Help me remember and rejoice in that truth. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Tenderness, he sought me, weary and sick with sin. And on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again. While angels in his presence sang unto the courts of heaven. on me oh the blood that bought me oh the grace that brought me to the fold of god grace that brought me to the fold of god yeah. died for me he died for me while i was sinning needy and poor and blind he whispered to assure me I found thee thou art mine I never heard a sweeter voice it made my aching heart rejoice oh the love that's on me to the fold of God Grace that brought me to the fold of God Upon His grace I'll daily ponder and sing anew His praise With all adoring wonder 
His blessings I retrace It seems as if the eternal days Are far too short to sing His praise Oh, the love that's on me Oh, the blood that bought me Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God Grace that brought me to the fold of God Yeah Oh my son Oh, the love that's on me Oh, the blood that bought me Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God Grace that brought me to the fold of God. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath and flood lose all their guilty states lose all their guilty states lose all their guilty states and sin nobler and sweeter song when this poor lisping stammering tongue when this poor lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave then in a nobler sweeter song I'll sing power to save. I'll see thy power to save. I'll see thy power to save. And in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll see thy power to save.
Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Ben Hirsch. I'm one of our pastors here, and I'm excited to share a, a couple of announcements with you. This year has made us much more aware of the uncertainties of life, particularly when it comes to our finances. That said, Exodus wants to provide you with resources to help you learn some of what the Bible has to say about managing your money and give you lots of practical applications for those truths. Starting September 23rd, we're offering a class called Financial Peace University. It's popularly referred to as FPU. FPU will run weekly on Wednesday nights for nine weeks here at the mill. The class fee is $130, and that's for either a couple or an individual. Now that fee goes directly to the FPU company, which covers all of the course materials for the class. Additionally, Exodus will be offering free childcare for the whole nine weeks, if, if that's something you need. We'll of course have applicable COVID precautions for while we are here in person. Now, if that's something you're interested in being a part of, we would love for you to join us. You can sign up on Realm. Next, don't forget that this week on Wednesday is our Exodus students fall kickoff. Now that's for everyone in sixth through 12th grade. I know it's gonna be an awesome time as our students reunite, reunite and it will be here at the mill at 630 with a parent meeting at eight. Now finally, don't forget to sign up for our women's Bible study. It starts in just two weeks and there are so many options to attend. We'll host a study here at the mill. We'll also have small group meetings in some homes, group meetings over Zoom, or you could even just do it on your own. You can find more information and sign up on Realm. We hope these ministries will help you grow in your knowledge and love of the Lord while also enjoying community with others. If you have questions about any of these things, please contact us at info at Thank you for being a part of our Exodus family and have a great week.